Welcome back to our closing panel discussion. Throughout the whole day, we have talked about AI and blockchain and very much approached it from a perspective of, well, how can it make us more efficient? How can it grow industries, businesses? What's the economic value and so on? But this panel is a bit different. We are raising the question how we can use technology to increase human potential and can technology even help us to understand us better and maybe make us more human? And I have two fantastic guests with uh, us today. Um, Carl Hayden Smith, uh, he's the director and founder of the Museum of Consciousness and the co-founder of Cyberdelic Society. And um, Carl, you're also the former head of research, director of the Learning Technology Research Center at the Ravensbourne University in London. So thanks for being with us today. And we have Camila Olsinka. Um, you are the chief uh, technology officer of iMind Institute. And what's really interesting about you is that you combine both the technical expertise but also the spiritual approach. Um, you are a physicist, a programmer, as well as neuromeditation and mindfulness trainer, which I think is a very fascinating profile. And I look forward to our conversation. Um, because we have such very specific um, research fields, uh, can I ask you to let us know a bit more about what has been um, your focus so far, where is your expertise, um, and, and what have you learned so far from your research? Carl, starting with you. Thank you so much, and thanks so much for the invitation to speak. So yeah, my, my work's very much um, cognitive science, really. That's 25 years um, in the cognitive space but really interested in consciousness and perception and how do we explore the human condition and understand that it's our kind of birthright to explore our consciousness. And uh, you know, a lot of people spend their times just whiling away their time on Netflix. So I'm really interested in all the different, the whole spectral nature of consciousness and the different modalities for, through which we can explore our consciousness. And, and you know, really push the boundaries of that. So I, I do a lot of work in um, the psychedelic space as well. I've spent six years at Imperial uh, doing DMT research and uh, being sort of legally uh, injected with DMT whilst having my brain scanned. So trying to work out, not, not to try and help with depression, but literally to find out what is consciousness. So it's a very unique study in that sense. But I'm also looking at non-drug altered states. So how do we use sound? Um, I run the Museum of Consciousness out of Oxford University. And uh, we're very interested in challenging musicians, but also sound designers um, to, to create an altered state just with sound within 20 minutes that we can measure that works across cultures, across ages, and across genders. And the science of sound is very still kind of new. It's th there's not there's not there's not a lot of e um, evidence, and there's not a lot. There's it's difficult to measure the effects of sound specifically. And then the cyberdelic society is very much around technology. How do we use technology to change consciousness? And I think we can see the the sort of crazed effect that machine learning. I, w I don't I don't use AI as a term because there is no such thing at the moment, at least, a, a machine learning is, is mad, madly affecting our perception. And, uh, you know, and I think some of the talks earlier today, you know, there's the human project is not over. We, might, we may feel redundant already, but I think that there's, there's still plenty for us to do and also plenty for us to understand about what is human. Because, um, you know, the post-humanists will tell you that the human project is over and we should just sort of step down. But I think that we don't really know what, what what is the human condition? And I'm very interested in this idea of hyperhumanism rather than transhumanism. So how do we go into um, the human body and understand through the quantified self? And I know you're doing a lot of work in that space. It's, it's this idea of really revealing the mysteries within and whether you've got an aura ring that's telling you how much REM you're getting or whether it's another, another sensor that's telling you about your heart rate variability. I think that you know, I've just had my whole genome mapped, and it's a bit like the ho the genie's out of the bottle because now I know when I'm going to die and what how I'm going to die, and it's like, <laughs> what have I done? Like seriously, <laughs> what a terrible, <laughs> terrible idea. But then I can change things according to that data, so it's also extremely useful. But I'm very interested in what I call eco-social feedback, so we can go into the body and understand the body, but then we can also go into the environment and understand how our behavior affects the environment. So it's the quantified self of the environment as well that I'm particularly interested in using technologies to sense. 
fantastic, fascinating, and we're gonna uh, explore a bit more the question of how technology and you know us humans are connected or how we should be connected. Um, Emilia, can you tell us a bit more about your work? Because I love your profile because it's so diverse. Um, well, I I worked for many many years as an as an IT expert. So I, I studied physics, and then I worked uh, at the end as a high-level specialist of DevOps and how to set up the entire process from the idea to the product, m mostly in the software. Um, but what I'm mentioning this one hand is, yeah, the technology is easy for me. Okay, that's that's one thing. The other thing is that when when people are working with technology, they brain works differently, and I, I noticed that quite early. So in high school, I was able to write poems. After study, I couldn't come back to that. Mm -hmm. I just noticed how the brain changes. And this observation of the brain, I think it started when I was 14 and I started to meditate. It was quite young age for that. But um, I think thanks to this meditation practice, as well, I was able to observe my brain through entire life, the most of the time, and I noticed how the brain is changes change uh, changed according to what the way we use it, and it's inspiring. So I was able to learn language in a weekend. Okay, <laughs> I had meditation, which increased my concentration, and I was working with programming for a long time. And I I I got the state flow. Do you know the flow state? When you program, when you do something what you love, it's like you. You are not there, so it's very, very inspiring. What's what can be done with our brain if we know how to use it? And then I switched. I wanted to connect technology and meditation, and I started to work with neuro meditation and neurofeedback. When we measure your brain waves, and we know more or less how you use the brain, and we can teach us to go in some state intentionally. So what happens in such states is very interesting because quite often <coughs> our brain is used a, pure, a bit differently than in a daily life and uh, neuroplasticity starts to work then because new areas are waken up and we can get new connections. So the more you do something the better you are in that. So be careful how you use your brain. It's very important. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. And I mean, the question of our panel discussion is how to use technology to increase human potential. What role does technology play in your field of work? Yeah. Uh, what ha how have you used it so far? And Carl, starting with you. And also what kind of technology? Yeah, well, I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at immersive technologies and done a lot of European projects until Brexit, um, but uh, yeah, the uh, the kind of work that I've done is training astronauts with mixed reality and, and using neurofeedback to push people, you know, if people are relaxed, they're gonna be be able to be pushed further into complexity. Vygotsky in theory that if you're, you know, your, your zone of proximal development will depend on your state of mind. So if we can actually get a state of mind and what we did in the, uh, the Horizon 2020 project that, uh, that I ran, we, we basically um, created a wearable with multiple sensors, heart rate variability, galvanic skin response, temperature, and those three sensors uh, fused together will, will give you a pretty good reliable altered state, I mean, uh, measurable state of your, of your concentration or your relaxation, and therefore we can adjust the complexity of the training. And it's expensive to train astronauts, so we work with Microsoft to um, to basically capture um, using the Hololens, uh, and thank God the Hololens one came out in 2015. We we used that device to actually capture the performance of an astronaut, um, and you can you, you can capture head movement, eye movement, hand movement, and individual finger movement. And then uh, a novice surgeon or a novice astronaut can actually wear the expert and mm -hmm. be in the body of the expert, and actually we can increase knowledge transfer by 40 percent by by you having ghost hands of the expert and being embodied in the expert's perspective, so that's that's an example of a, of a typical project. But I'm I'm now very much more interested in you know how do we what happens if the electricity goes out? 
You know, how can we use technologies that maybe just don't depend on high tech? Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in, you know, some some of the the technologies of the body. You know, the the breath work, the meditation, all all the things that we can do to to adjust our own physiologies. And I think that we need to be resilient. And um, you know, as a lot of my friends remind me, that it's it's the indigenous that will survive if there is a, a some sort of major crash of the economy or whatever else. So. I think it's it's uh, it's about looking to the to the ancient technologies to the uh, the indigenous communities as well as having the high tech. So having a foot in both camps, in the, very much in the analog world, but also in the digital world, and also learning from other species. I think that what we do is we get very human centric, and I, and I like to design technologies from a human centric perspective. But I also think that we can learn a lot from other species like the mycelium which are everywhere beneath our feet, and, and you could argue are, are much greater or grander uh, intelligence because, frankly, they've su survived five mass extinctions, and, and, and we, as humans, are causing the sixth. So um, what can we learn from a, from a superior intelligence? And actually, I'm building prosthetic devices at the moment in a, in a project that we called Umwelt Hacking. And if you don't know what, you know, we're, we're in a country where you should know Umwelt. Umwelt is your sensorial system. And uh, so we're trying to create experiences and prosthetics that you wear that don't involve digital technology but are very analog that enable you to become forest or to become mycelium and that ability to then have that sense. Um, so for instance, we have these wind whiskers. So you're actually wearing uh, these sort of very analog devices that, um, that enable you to feel the wind as if you have multiple branches. So it's this embodied cognition, this embodied, distributed knowledge that I think um, we can learn from and we can actually become more resilient and, and learn from other species. I think that we're, we're seeing now with machine learning um, that, that you know, we're mirroring the human experience, but how can we mirror uh, the, the other species and learn from them as well? Fascinating. Mila, what about you, technology in the context of your work? Well, what's the role of it? How are you using it? Well, what was used by NASA like 40 years ago, okay. now we can use for regular people. And uh, it's thanks to that EEG equipment is, is much smaller right now. So at the beginning it was like huge case which took like half of the room and right now it's like such a piece. Yeah. Uh, such such piece of, of, of equipment. And um, so what I believe is more and more because of thanks to revolution in the technology, more and more such stuff we can use at home or in some special places for everyone, okay? That's that's the first and very important thing, that we have access to such uh, solution and, and making people aware is possible. It's it's important to me. So neurofeedback right now for me is, is really good tool because then you teach yourself, you teach your brain to recognize what you do with it. Can you explain a bit more how <coughs> neurofeedback sure. works? So neurofeedback is when we measure your brain waves. Yeah. You have like like cap on your head. I measure all of the brain waves, and uh, uh, the the signal is going to the computer and software checks. Okay, and what is checked? If we are closer to some brain state or farther. Okay. So I guide some meditation or some coaching or something that this person has to visualize something or use the breath. I search for a special method which works for this person, mm -hmm. okay? And this person at the same time has a signal. It can be music, it can be video, it can be vibration. And this person gets feedback in real time. If the state, if, if the person is in the state or not, and we learn much, much for faster than usually. Like meditation, we can start to understand what to do after six weeks. Okay, comparing the time when I was tried starting to meditate, it's it's much, much faster. And another thing for people with ADHD is very important because one of the famous things we can do, we can increase on our concentration. And statistics say that even 70% of kids can stop taking drugs for ADHD thanks to this training. Okay, it doesn't fix the ADHD, yeah. but the kid is able to focus on the lesson and listen to the teacher enough, well enough, that no drugs is is, is necessary anymore. And just believe, rem just imagine what 
it means for parents, okay, mm -hmm. that you don't have to give drugs to your kid and it can he or she can focus. And we can do the same with creativity, we can do the same with relaxing. So you have you can have like entire instruction of yourself what to do to be relaxed now, mm -hmm. even if something happened. And it, it increases resilience as well, because you somehow can use your brain instead of the opposite. So then what I'm hearing is that I almost think this would get a manual, how to use myself or how to operate myself, especially my brain, so to get a bit more control. Is this, uh, am I hearing this correctly? <coughs> well, you first of all, you learn how to, to observe your brain, yeah. observe your thoughts, observe your emotions. And then, uh, in addition, you also know what to do if you'd like to be relaxed. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, I feel something, most often in the body, okay, something happened, body reacts first, always. If someone scares you, body reacts first, then you'll think, what was that, okay? So you feel your body, you know which state it is, you know that you feel some, I don't know, anxiety or something. And then you remember you are trained. To, all you have to do is sit down and use your belly breath to calm your nervous system down. Mm -hmm. And you have such power after weeks or months. Interesting. Just, just on that, I think you talk about an operating system for, for the human. I mean, they're so uh, we're not robots, you know, and I think that that's the problem. I think that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're adopting that kind of, uh, you know, we're, we're making the robots human and, and robotizing ourselves. And I think there's a huge danger with thinking that there's just simple simple solutions, f or uh, or you can you can have recipes for everyone that will work the same, I think that it's about exploration and it's about trying these different technologies and not necessarily technologies that cost a lot of money, but just simple hacks and s and even the problem pr the the term hack, I think is an issue uh, and uh, and a problem. So, but yeah, I think. Um, you know, most of us could just do well with slowing down and savoring things and, and tasting the food and, uh, you know, not, not being obsessed with productivity. And I think that actually in some ways the pandemic was a blessing for a lot of people because we suddenly realized, oh, my God. And there was something called the Great Resignation, right, where most people realize their jobs are horrible and uh, they wanted to just not do that anymore. So it gave people a window of time where they realized, oh, my God, I've got a family and I've got friends, and I, I really want to invest some time in them because you live for 1,000 months. You know, that's 83 years. And people think they own stuff. You know, you don't even own your own bodies. Um, so just be, be in the human experience. I think that we've, we're, we're always trying to escape the human experience. And maybe we've actually got it all wrong, and we've, we've won the jackpot to be human for this short, very short window of time. And I think that it's, um, it's not about constantly hijacking that. What does it mean for you to be human? I'm still finding out. Yeah. You know, I think that that's the beauty of it, that it's a, it's a, it's a short run, and um, it's, it's about exploring your consciousness. I think your consciousness, your attention. You know, we are constantly hijacked by the social media, and I think it's, be, it's just, think about you know, how often your attention is, is, is taken away. I think if you can maintain your attention and have a daily medita meditation practice, it's extremely useful. Um, and, and, and there's many, many different types of meditation. There's many, many different types of dance. There's many, many different types. But get inside your body. I mean, I've spent sort of 50 years out of body in my head mostly just thinking. And now it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's about how do I get into the heart and how do I get back into the, the, the embodiment practices. So that's what I'm, that's for me the human experience is, is being embodied as much as you can. Is anyone of you meditating on a daily basis or a few times a week? Do we have any? Yeah, a few. Interesting. Um, what have Mila, What have you learned personally about yourself? You know, through your work, what has been the biggest aha moment? Um, I. I I was waiting for this moment, okay? Yeah. But it was my brain map, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so <coughs> I knew a lot around uh, brainwaves already before, and finally when I got an equipment for that, it was like, y yeah, I, I knew some things, but, but then you see your entire brain, okay, which region is more active than usually, less active, what it might mean, it might be potential, but it might be a risk behind. And you see, Actually, you can see like fMRI scans when you use the signal well. You know, there is a special algorithm which tells you 
in the not, not only on the surface what mm -hmm. happens, but also inside. So we, then you see your brain like, ah, oh, okay, that's interesting. <coughs> you see also connections, left, right, back, front. And, um, and that's a lot of information about the way you use your brain. Okay, so I'll have a lot of fast brain waves. That's uh, very special, uh, special for uh, people with analytical skills and um, and also there is a r we can plan everything like we see 10 possible solutions for something ha what might happen in future but if you add any negative emotion to that you can focus because of we have negativity bias mm -hmm. but long story but we can focus only on those paths in the future which are negative and it's a short way to be to have an anxiety and i had it and then <coughs> the way i teach meditation i use the brain map that I know the brain of the person, and then I suggest special meditation. Because if I have a lot of brain waves, I need a meditation which will provide me with more slow brain waves with theta, which is not much there, okay? If the person has a lot of theta, but not much gamma, mm -hmm. it's a bit of speed up, because this person might have problem of concentration. So th this is for me very unique. I work with people. I explain them a lot about the brainwave, and it tells them like, "Wow, I didn't know you can read such many things out of just those pictures." And yeah. I said, "Yes, I can, because I see how you use your brain day by day, and what is missing there." Mm -hmm. Interesting, Carl. What about you? What have you learned about yourself in the, in the years of your research work? So I started out um, doing a lot of 3D modeling. So I was very lucky to be reconstructing ancient buildings around the world. And uh, just doing a lot of 3D modeling really changed my real world perception. And I've done a TED TEDx talk on this, but it's this idea that, uh, yeah, I could, because they were very large buildings I was modeling and I'm, you know, I'm, they're 3D models, but I'm modeling them on a, via a 2D screen. Um, but it was it was extraordinary the effect because I was suddenly a better driver. I could see further down the road, and I was I was also um, aware. You know, I was sort of programming my dreams. I was falling asleep, um, having done a lot of three D uh, modeling, and then I was dreaming about these structures. So it made me realize that you can program your dreams. I mean, if you, if you're building these things, maybe not so much if you're in a game environment and you're just playing a game, but actually if you're building those environments, world building, you know, is a, is a thing. And then I realized, oh, hang on a minute, so I'm actually also building memory palaces. And I don't mm -hmm. know if you know the, the, the sort of the phenomenology of memory palaces, but the Greek orators would actually have these virtual pieces of architecture in their heads that they did, they, you know, they would have seven hour speeches that they would then map into these architectural structures and all they would need to do is remember the path through the structure in order to, to reconstruct that, ins that whole seven hour speech. So what did they have that we lost through our, you know, our media use and the way we actually um, use technologies today? So it's, you know, it's, it's, that's what I mean by these kind of crossovers between the ancient and the modern and, and not actually really knowing the implications of the technologies we're using. So for me, it's um, you know it was a, an exciting revelation to know that I could program my reality based on my use of the digital. Fascinating. Um, before we go ahead, do we have any questions from you, the audience, or any comments? Not yet. Um, because I guess we also have uh, quite a few representatives from businesses. We have students here, entrepreneurs. How can what you have to have discovered in your research work, how should this be applied in, um, in the business side as well? Like what impact can it have uh, or from an academic perspective? And how do we make this, this knowledge transfer? So yeah, I think that uh, business can learn a lot from um, these, these practices of being resilient. And uh, I think that the, the crashes that we're seeing at the moment with the, the silicon Valley Bank that's just got you know, just crashed. I think that it's it's very much a case of um, you know you know if we look at the 80s where there was so much money fl sloshing around it, it makes people lazy. I think that if you if you're limited in the tools that you have, you're gonna you're gonna be more creative. It's like a it's like a musician that suddenly has access to a hundred different instruments. 
and doesn't really know any of them. You know, and one musician that has built one machine and, and suddenly he's super uh, creative. And, and I think that that's, you know, we, n we need to learn to, to, to be more humble and to, in business, to just not be wasteful. I think that it's, it's much more about the, it's what you do with what you've got, really. Ilya? Well, uh, for me, the flow state is very important, okay? It uh, can only be used by business and by IT person, by everyone. So according to McKinsey, your, your, your creativity increases. Like, you know, McKinsey and DARPA and, and NASA, they made a lot of research. So it's like your, your uh, ability to learn things and your creativity increases like 500% or 490 and so. So if you're in the flow if state, you are in the flow can state. you describe the flow state for us? Well, when you are pulled in by your activity, there is nothing more, okay? You just don't feel time, you don't think about yourself, about your ambition, you are just this activity. Mm -hmm. And because of extremely nice cocktail of neurotransmitters. You feel wonderful. You have endorphins, serotonins, and a lot of dopamine, everything what is your now yeah, nice, and we look for it in our activities. We actually need this state. Yeah. We love it. Our body love it. Okay, loves it. So when you are in the state, you can do much more. So you can work one day instead of five, or you can have five projects instead of one, so it's up to you, okay? But on the other hand, it's very important that this state is in the same time very healthy for our brain. So the way meditation trains our way, uh, brain is that we are able to switch or to concentrate on or something, okay, it, it, it's a training, but okay, not much happens then. When you are in the flow state, you have exactly the same training for your networks in your brain, okay, that you can stuck to one thing which you'd like to do. And the result is that you learn something. You learn how to play an instrument, you, you program a lot, or you have extremely great ideas and extremely nice creativity. It just depends the way you'd like to use the state. And ability to go into the state on demand, okay, I just need it. It's not just when I'm dancing or it's not just when I'm running but I can use it when I'm at home with kid, okay? I can use it when I'm, okay, I don't like it, but you, once you know yourself and you know your triggers, you can drive yourself into that state, which is very nice. You are productive, you finish earlier, you have more time, and on this, in the same time, your brain is much more healthy. That's, that's, that's a very important thing, that productivity and also psychological safety and nice training is there. So I, I would suggest to look for that. Can I give you one example from yesterday? So some of us were in the virtual Florence session and we had uh, the collective creativity protocol. So we're, you know, it was a 12 hour session, but we're, you know, we were asking, asked a lot in, in that session, but we're also given the opportunity to really reset our physiology, get into the flow state, lots of different uh, techniques to do that and then we went to the hyperbaric chamber which is out there I don't know if you've got had a chance to try it we've also got a showcase where we've got the um, the anti-gravity uh, experience pendulum Arcangelo created that at the back and we've got at the, the front here my friend Eddie Castaneda that create has created a multi-dimensional fish tank so uh, try these experiences out I think that what what we need in business is the ability to just you know step away from your screen at least uh, for 10 minutes every hour simple stuff that remember you've got a body you know remember that you have bodily uh, you know be kind to yourself I think is the key message mm -hmm. that's a very important message uh, Mila, if you allow me I want to touch on a bit more about this um, flow state because to me the flow state is when I am in an activity where I just forget time I'm fully present and I enjoy it like for me it's dancing and running uh, but then when you think of productivity, it's usually related to work, which maybe is not the most enjoyable activity. So how can I transfer, you know, what I feel during dancing, this flow state, to to then my work when I need to be productive? And how long does it take you to, to train yourself to do this? So the flow training, it might take like uh, 10, 12, 14 weeks. Okay. And it's based on finding your triggers for... for 
particular person, triggers for particular person which will help her or him to get into this flow, to, to, to the flow state. So once you know, for example, dancing is, so your flow goes from your body and music. So then we check what's your emotional state there. And then we suggest that before, I don't know, cleaning your house, you just need to turn on the music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So such things, we find such things to let you, to help you um, repeat the state on demand. It doesn't matter what you do. Interesting. Does any one of you have an activity where you are in your flow state? Do you do? You, yeah. Can I ask what, what's yours? Uh, coding. Coding. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Um, I, I, I mean, I think it's fascinating, you know, that we have this opportunity to understand ourselves better, to, you know, also be able to be more in control. But at the same time, isn't it also a bit scary that, you know, you <laughs> have to deal with yourself to really, you know, understand what's going on internally? Isn't it much more convenient to just, you know? Be as remain as you are, like know a bit, bit about yourself, but not too much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, that ignorance is bliss sometimes, yeah. and uh, it's really important to just zone out and watch Netflix now and again. But I just think that it's a balance, isn't mm. it? It's, you know, we, we it's, we're not machines. We're, we're not meant to be optimized all the time. We are messy human beings, and I think that, that that's something to celebrate. I don't, I don't think that we. We need to be the you know super on it all the time. So I, ju I just think it's 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 about cooking, right? Cooking with different technologies, different opportunities, and really just enjoying yourself. You know, enjoy every minute. You know, as much as you can, because at the end of the day, we we we're all here to to thrive and to to help each other. And I think that's why sharing is caring. Mm. Yeah. The last thing, just, yeah, what as Carl said, be careful how you use technology. So we already know that using GPS every day just shrinks your hippocamp, which is responsible for your memory. And just to understand and know such things, okay, everybody, ch every tool changes us, okay, pen changes us, computer changes us, car changes us, definitely, yeah, right, yeah. we changed. So understanding, because we use a lot of technology, I'm sure that, all of you use a lot use a lot of technology. So understanding how does this influence your brain and what you do, what you need to do to stay healthy is very, very import important. And another thing is the social connection with another person and the relationships and you know, face to face, meeting other people. Let's don't drop it for VR or something like this. Our body really needs that. We mm -hmm. need each other really. Looking ahead, uh, where do you, um, what are you most excited about still exploring in, in your research field? Is there any topic that you're currently focused on or do you want to deep dive into a specific field? What, what, do you, what, do, what is your plan, so to say, for the next few years? Um, I, I guess I'm really interested in, in living technology rather than digital technology. So how do, how do we explore, um, you know, th th I don't know if you've seen recently the, the mushroom computer that's being used. I mean, you could argue it's a transhumanist uh, approach to um, looking at other species, but yeah, they're, they're, they're realizing that signals can be generated through mycelium and then you can actually uh, create a computer from that. So I, I think that, yeah, regenerative technologies, I think sustainability isn't enough. Mm -hmm. So I'm really, I'm really interested in this term regenerative. How do we well, with whatever we're doing, with whatever startups we're, we're creating, how do we regenerate the community around us? And I think it's all about, you know, in real life change. It's, yeah, let's not, let's not, I mean, the metaverse, has it been canceled? I think it was being, it's being canceled in Zuckerberg's version of it, at least, has, uh, seems to have died. And uh, so he's pivoted to machine learning and uh, like everyone. But th I think that, yeah, I think what happened in the pandemic, I know a lot of, some of my friends created startups around, you know, remaining online and, and partying online and, and all the rest of it. But nobody wanted to do that. And, and, and I think that's a really great sign that, um, that we want to be embodied, we want to be in, in, in real life. And, uh, and let's continue with that. Mm. Hey, what about you? What are you most excited about in, for your work in the future? <coughs> 
Uh, as we as we discussed, yes. So for me, because at the beginning I have a lot of data about, about the person, mm -hmm. and the idea is that all those data and all the processes which we have with people, we can feed machine learning with that, and at the end we can have entire instruction of yourself just after reading all the data at the beginning, and you know we will be able to learn about ourselves even faster. So this is this is what I would like to do in future as soon as great. possible. Yeah, that's great. Um, any questions from the audience before I get to ask my last one? No? All right, then um, since you are experts in your field, you know, exploring consciousness, really understanding how our brain works, how we can also get a bit more control of it instead of it controlling us, um, I'm totally new to that, uh, pretty much, and I'm not sure about the rest of the audience, but what can I do? What's your advice to me as someone who is just starting out in that field? What can I do today or tomorrow to you know, make the first step toward becoming maybe more conscious, more mindful, trying to understand myself a bit better? I think it's, yeah, just look at the, the different technologies that may resonate with you. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that the you know the the ability to to understand your sleep for instance is such a powerful tool you know how much rem are you getting what's your sleep hygiene like you know what's your diet doing to you i think that these things if you can if you can understand that then that's that's your foundation and then how much energy have you got how much do you want to invest that energy into into your brain how much do you want to invest it into your exercise and it's you know it's it's the human the human condition. I think that what machine learning can potentially do for us is is be a mirror, right? Mm. It can it can at the moment show us the the biases because all you know the Chat GPT debacle is at the moment it's all trained on Reddit and and Wikipedia and, and most of it's white middle aged men ranting and uh, and uh, and it's and it's it's spitting that back at us. So I think that that's in a sense really useful because we can sort of you know, then then recognize that, you know, do we want that to represent humanity? I don't think so. So how do we how do we become better humans? And I think that the technology should enable us to to really deep dive into the into the human project and really and what I call hyperhumanism. So tomorrow I give a, a keynote uh, with all the different technologies that are hyperhuman as opposed to transhuman and and Eddie and I have been working on that project for very many years and uh, and I think that yeah, I think people need uh, to counter the transhumanist agenda, I think every, you know nobody really seriously thinks that um, you know plugging something directly into your brain is healthy or, or not necessarily wise. And so, so how do we how do we uh, you know ramp up our abilities without this sort of invasive technology? Mm. Thank you, Mila. What is your advice? Do as many things which you like as possible. Yeah. That's <laughs> that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Every single day, starting now. So getting into the flow. Exactly. Brilliant. Well, I really liked <laughs> having this conversation with you. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and giving us an insight into your work. Um, and I think it's a good reminder at the end of the day, you know, where we talk talked so much about different types of technology to end in the note of us you know, being human and we can under use technology to understand us a bit better, which is very important. So thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you. Thank, thank you, you as well to the audience. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>